recording. All right, welcome everyone. Welcome YouTube. It's good to be here at our next seminar. So uh, this is our second water wetlands and watershed seminar for spring 2024. Um, today we're lucky enough to have zooming in from Raleigh, North Carolina is Dr. Natalie Nelson. Um, Dr. Nelson is an associate professor and university faculty scholar in biological and agricultural engineering at the North Carolina State University. She actually got her PhD and her bachelor's here at UF in ag and bioengineering up in Fraser Rogers Hall um, in a concentration in interdisciplinary hydrologic sciences. So if anyone is interested in hydrology, there's actually a, a hydrologic certificate uh, concentration available through the Water Institute. And if you have questions, I can answer uh, those later. Her lab characterizes and models non-point source pollution in inland and coastal waters. So anyone willing to throw out a definition for non-point source pollution? So if that's what your focus is on, we should know what it is. It should probably tell us, but Rita, what's non-point source pollution? Pollution that you can't identify an exact source of. So like, it's generally. Uh -huh. So Rita said, so pollution, you can't identify the exact source or you can't point to a specific one location, but it's more broad coming from a more broad area of the landscape, like runoff, okay? She takes a watershed, uh, Dr. Nelson takes a watershed scale approach to studying where and why non-point source pollution occurs and presumably yeah. what we can do about it and how to stop it. So with that, Dr. Nelson, the floor is yours. Uh, and I think, let's see, that looks good. I'm gonna spotlight you and you can go ahead. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for the invitation to present today. Um, I attended this seminar almost weekly when I was a graduate student. And I've never presented in the seminar series, so it's such a delight to be able to be part of it, um, especially because I, I got a lot from it as a graduate student. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize the video view on my screen. Um, and I'm mentioning that just because if anything's going wrong, please be sure to holler out because I can't see you. Um, so today I'm going to be focusing on some projects that we have ongoing in which we're studying fecal contamination at the coast. Um, in my lab, like David mentioned before, we're focusing on a few different areas. We have a pretty strong emphasis on nutrient pollution in inland and coastal waters. And then also in coastal waters, we look at fecal contamination. And I think uh, several people at UF are already familiar with some of my nutrient pollution work, but probably less familiar with the fecal contamination work. Um, and so I wanted to focus on that today. Before I dive in, I want to acknowledge that the work I'm presenting today is a collaborative effort involving many different students and faculty. So the studies that I'll be presenting on are part of the PhDs of Megan Carr and Julia Harrison, and I'll spotlight them when I'm presenting their work. Uh, but there are also some co-PIs engaged, so Angela Harris and Catherine Inardi, who are both in the faculty on, in the civil engineering department here at NC State. And then some additional collaborators include Miyuki Hino at UNC at Chapel Hill and Adam Gold, who's with the Environmental Defense Fund. And we've had a team of undergrad students who have been helping us in the field. All right, so first to give a bit of a primer, I'll start by explaining that when it comes to fecal contamination at the coast, stormwater runoff is the dominant form of transport. So you typically tend to see fecal contamination events at the coast occurring immediately after rainfall events. And that's because as you have rain coming across the land, it essentially flushes the land surface. So you have runoff that's generated. It can then transport fecal matter that's on the land um, out to the coast. Uh, but you also have issues with wastewater treatment system failures that occur after heavy rains. And so there's just increased opportunity from a variety of different mechanisms to have fecal contamination immediately following rain. And so the rain can then transport, when I talk about fecal matter sources, these are going to include um, sources from agriculture, such as livestock waste. From urban areas, you have pet waste, but also issues with centralized wastewater system failures. And then in more rural areas, you can also have issues with septic systems um, potentially being at capacity when you have these large rain events. And so just to summarize then, the stormwater runoff is transporting fecal matter from these different sources on land to the coast. And we know that this is a really well-established relationship. And so when you have fecal contamination at the coast, there are a few different concerns from a public health perspective. So the first is when people are swimming at the beach, if they ingest water that's been fecally contaminated, 
They're then at risk of potentially contracting gastrointestinal illness, um, which could be serious, even life-threatening. And then also there are shellfish such as oysters and clams that are grown or harvested along the coast and they're filter feeders so they take up the water around them and they can also take up some of those fecally associated pathogens during the filter feeding process. And so when shellfish is harvested from waters that are contaminated, the shellfish can also become contaminated. And so because of this, there are different um, regulatory practices in place to prevent the public from getting sick due to contaminated coastal waters. So the first is in these recreational waters like beaches and estuaries. Uh, regulatory offices like FDEP will post signage to alert the public that that area is potentially contaminated with bacteria. So here, for example, you can see some signs and then people ignoring them in the background. <laughs> with shellfish waters, they're more strict about the ways in which they enforce then um, these different regulatory measures. So here, for example, in North Carolina, and there are similar practices in Florida, um, you're looking at a stretch of the North Carolina coastline here where these different colored polygons are sounds and bays. And so these are waters where shellfish can be harvested or grown. Uh, but they're areas that are prone to some ephemeral fecal contamination following rain. And so the regulatory offices here in North Carolina have assigned rainfall thresholds to these different shellfish harvest areas, and that's what these colors correspond to. So here you can see the legends, the colors correspond from dark red to this pale yellow, which corresponds to one to four inches within a 24 hour period. And so basically, depending on the rainfall threshold that's assigned to an area, if the rain exceeds that threshold within 24 hours, that area will automatically be closed for harvest, closed for shellfish harvest, and they'll only reopen once they've gone out and collected a sample to confirm that the fecal bacteria concentrations are sufficiently low such that you can safely harvest the shellfish. So my point here is also just to emphasize that this relationship between rainfall and fecal contamination is so well understood and established that we have these regulatory frameworks that are built around this relationship. And so in my lab, we've done some work related to then this connection between coastal fecal contamination and rainfall. So for example, we've created a decision support tool called Shellcast. It's a forecast and notification system that is intended to alert shellfish growers when these temporary harvest closures immediately following rain might occur. We have that currently available in North Carolina and South Carolina, and we're actually set to publish the Florida version of Shellcast later this semester. We also use rainfall information to create water quality forecast models. Um, so in this case, we were looking at shellfish waters across the coast of Florida. Uh, and this was work that one of my students, Nat Chazelle, had completed in its in-press with Marine Pollution Bulletin, where basically she was using rainfall that was summarized over different windows, like one, two, three days, all the way up through seven days to predict fecal bacteria concentrations in the water. And then she was also using forecasted rainfall from the National Weather Service to see if we could do several days in advance forecasting of the fecal bacteria concentrations. All right, so I, I went over the, these projects in which we're using the relationship between rain and fecal contamination pretty quickly, because I mostly just wanted to highlight that this is a well-established relationship. Um, but several projects I have in my lab right now are focused on trying to understand whether there could be events aside from rainstorms that are also contributing to this type of episodic coastal fecal contamination. And one particular event that we've been focusing on is tidal flooding. Um, so tidal flooding is the temporary overflowing of salt water onto normally dry land, and this is often occurring during higher than average high tides, so basically during high water level events like king tides and perigean tides. Um, so this is an image of a tidal flood in an urban community here in North Carolina. And these tidal floods are sometimes also referred to as sunny day floods, blue sky floods, because they're floods that occur primarily because of the tide or because of marine water levels and not necessarily because of rain. And these tidal floods are occurring at increasing frequency across coastal communities, particularly on the South Atlantic and Gulf Coast, because sea levels are rising. So here I have a graph of sea level rise. Uh, this is pulled from one of the NOAA tide gauges located in Wilmington, North Carolina. 
And here what you're looking at is sea level on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And the plot starts at about 1970. And so the gray points are showing you the average annual sea level, um, actually less than average, but or less than annual, I should say, but it's showing you then the sea level over time. And then this black dashed line is showing you the trajectory. And so what you can see is in the past few decades, past 20 years or so, we've had about a half a foot increase in sea level. And if you look at the trajectory moving forward, it's surpassing what is predicted based on existing scenarios. So we know that sea levels are rising, and even though half a foot might not sound like very much, that can translate to quite a big jump when you think about the ways in which coastal infrastructure is installed. So here, for example, I have an image of a house. So this is an image created by NOAA, and you can see under the house here we have a stormwater pipe. So here the stormwater pipe and our stormwater systems in general were designed to route stormwater as quickly as possible off the land surface and into coastal waterways, at least in coastal communities. Um, so these systems were in many cases designed and installed decades ago without accounting for future increases in sea level. And so today what we're seeing is that because sea levels have risen, we now have opportunity for marine waters to come up through the stormwater system, such that the stormwater system is basically a conduit for the tide to come in and flood into communities. So in many cases, these tidal floods aren't occurring because they're overtopping uh, seawalls or bulkheads, but instead it's quite common for them to be coming up through the stormwater system. And so because of that, if you start paying attention to these tidal floods in different communities, you'll often see that the road floods first. So here, for example, I'm showing a time lapse that I had pulled from Twitter um, from Hollywood Beach in Florida, where the flood first started by creeping up along the curbs, and then it gradually then came over the crest of the road. And so here you'll see the water starts here and then continues to pool over. And so that's really typical, again, because the water is often coming up through a storm drain. And so in the process of coming up through storm drains, we know that there is opportunity to come in contact with different sources of fecal pollution. So for example, these underground stormwater pipes are often going to be running either in close proximity to or parallel sanitary sewer lines. And these underground pipes are not perfectly sealed, so they're often leaky, and as a result of that, you can have sewage that is leaking out and then ends up in the stormwater system. The stormwater system itself is also not maintained for this type of fill and spill behavior. So if you look down in these catch basins or in the storm drains, you'll see that there's often a lot of muck there and that the pipes have biofilms. Um, and so we know that also these different types of fecal bacteria can persist in the environment. And so there could also be sources of bacteria from directly within the stormwater network. And then once the tidal floods then spill out onto land, there's opportunity to make contact with all sorts of different sources of fecal matter. So here, for example, I have an image that I had taken from a site in Carolina Beach here in North Carolina. And I've circled some trash cans that have fallen over and are filling with water and also some dog poop bags that are floating there. And that's what's bagged. You can imagine what's not bagged. So there's a lot of opportunity to make contact with different households and industrial pollutants. And so with these ideas in mind, we're interested in trying to understand then what is the effect of these tidal floods, which have opportunity to make contact with lots of pollutant sources, uh, what's their effect then on coastal waterways? So as those floods recede, do they end up impacting the water quality of the adjoining waters? Uh, and there's been very little research done on the water quality of tidal floods or their impacts. So for the most part, there's been some work done out of Norfolk, Virginia, um, but otherwise there's very little published literature to draw on. Uh, so to answer this question, this is part of Megan Carr's uh, PhD. So Megan Carr was actually a student there in SC at UF. Uh, she got her bachelor's there, and she's now here working on a PhD with me. And so Megan, to start addressing this question, went out to Beaufort, North Carolina, which is located in the central North Carolina coast. It's just a little south of the Outer Banks in the Pamlico Sound. And this is a community that's located right on the water. So 
Um, Beaufort is here on this peninsula and Taylor's Creek runs along Beaufort and that's what you see in this image here to the right. So Taylor's Creek, sometimes when I hear the word creek, I think of a kind of small system, but this is a large, well-flushed channel. Um, so here in Beaufort then, this street that runs right along Taylor's Creek is called Front Street and this is the main thoroughfare basically through the town. So most of the tourism is also centered around Front Street. And Front Street will periodically flood, particularly on the highest water level events. So that might occur during king tides, but also when we have different offshore systems that come through. And so at this site, Megan and a team of undergraduate research assistants were sampling the waters in Taylor's Creek and also in floodwaters on the roadway to start to understand what are the connections between these flooding events and fecal bacteria concentrations. So the samples they collected were processed for Enterococci bacteria. So Enterococcus is a group of bacteria that's used as the criterion indicator bacteria by the EPA for assessing the safety of recreational waters. Um, so this is the primary fecal indicator bacteria they use to assess risks from fecal contamination in coastal waters. And so Megan then collected samples at three different sites along Taylor's Creek that coincided with stormwater outfalls that could be then conveying um, the floodwaters. And she would also collect samples here at this one site on Front Street, which was prone to having flooding. So here you can see an image of her, for example, collecting a sample from one of these flood patches. And this work was done over summer 2022. Um, specifically, it started June 6th and then went all the way through August 2nd. And so every single day over this period, Megan would collect samples from those three different waterway sites between 8 and 9 a.m. so that we had a consistent baseline sample for each day in our study period. And then there were two different king tide events that happened. Uh, one happened in June and one happened in July. And so during these king tide events, we have the highest high tides, but also the lowest lows, so the, the most variation. And during these king tide periods, Megan would then collect samples more intensively during individual tidal cycles to capture the highest high. And then she would collect samples again during ebb tide and at low tide so that we could see what the water quality was like as the floodwaters receded. And so to understand what the flood conditions were like within the stormwater network during our study period, Megan had applied the bathtub model, which was developed by Adam Gold, um, and he published on that in 2022. And so basically with this bathtub model, you kind of treat the stormwater system like a bathtub. And so using the elevation, using elevation data for each of the different stormwater structures and the stormwater pipes, you can start to estimate using a kind of bathtub approach uh, what the water levels are like at each of those different stormwater structures as the tides increase. And so here in Beaufort, you're again looking at, this is Taylor's Creek, this blue strip here, and then this is the town proper, and the dark gray is showing you the different streets. And now these individual dark gray lines are showing you the stormwater network, and when it's a solid line, that's indicating that we have elevation data for that part of the network. And when you see a dashed line, it means that we know that there are stormwater pipes there, but we don't have specific elevation data for the different structures. And so we use the bathtub model to estimate the inundation within the stormwater system across the two networks that we have elevation data for. And then you can also see our sampling locations here for reference. And so we ran this model I should say Megan ran this model uh, for a baseline condition. So this was basically the average high tide and average low tide water levels during our study period. And she also ran it for the conditions that we observed during the king tide or the perigean tide periods. And so on the left, you have the low tide data and on the right, you have the high tide model outputs. And so there are a few takeaways here. The first is that during baseline conditions, so even without king tides, when we have a high tide, you can see here that there are these dots that are starting to show up on our map, and those are corresponding to different stormwater structures that have greater than 0% inundation. So there's some inundation that's occurring purely as a function of the of sea levels, not as a function of rain. And so even during baseline conditions, the system is routinely taking on water and we can see that there are some structures that are hitting 80 to 100% inundation even during baseline conditions. 
And then during our king tide conditions, we then saw that the water would propagate up all the way up to about one um, city block up from the waterway, and that there were multiple stormwater structures that were hitting max inundation, which would correspond um, with either flooding or maybe just seeing water about to hit the surface. So this is an area where even under baseline conditions, the stormwater system, while you might not see flooding occurring on the roadway, is routinely taking on water. Next, if we look at some of the samples from this time period, so I'm going to break down a few takeaways from this plot, but there's a lot going on here. So on the y-axis here on the bottom, we have our enterococcus concentrations. So these are the bacteria concentrations, the fecal bacteria concentrations. And it's shown over time for our entire study period. The gray shaded area is corresponding to our non-detect range. So basically, the values could be anywhere less than a concentration of 10. And then the gray points are showing you samples that we collected every day, so those baseline samples, and the purple dots correspond to samples collected during the two king tide periods. Each of our samples were processed in duplicate, so that's why you see this vertical line connecting points, because we wanted to ensure that we had an uncertainty estimate for each of our samples. And then when you see teal samples, those correspond to floodwater samples. So if there was a floodwater patch while, we went out, while Megan went out there to go sampling, she'd collect a sample, and then that's what's shown here. So the purple and gray are from the waterway, and the teal is from the road. And then this red horizontal line is corresponding to EPA's single sample maximum value for safe use of recreational water. So basically, if a concentration exceeds this limit, that usually indicates that there could be a concern um, for the safe use by swimmers and recreators of a beach, for example. All right, then at the top, we also have rainfall. Over the time period, the bars correspond to the amount of rain in a 24-hour period, and it's shown on an inverted scale here. So the shorter the bar, the less rain there is, and then the taller the bar, the more rain there was. And so one of our first takeaways from this is that we saw that the highest bacteria concentrations in the waterway occurred after rainfall. So here I've highlighted just a few examples with these arrows, but you can see there were a few days in our study period where we had quite a bit of rain within a 24-hour period, and we consistently would see that from our baseline samples, those samples we would collect between 8 and 9 a.m., that those samples would jump up and have higher concentrations immediately following those rain events. So again, this goes back to that foundational understanding we have that rain is a major driver of fecal contamination in coastal waters. Um, but there were some other features we saw in our data that were more specific to the king tides and tidal floods. So the first was that the roadway floodwaters consistently had high bacteria concentrations. So I've circled those here. Again, those are the teal points. Um, so these teal points then you're seeing are consistently above the EPA's single sample maximum threshold and by one to two orders of magnitude. So this is a log scale. So these concentrations were often quite high. Uh, and we saw that the high concentrations occurred when there was rain, but also when there wasn't rain. And the floodwater patches we observed were very local to the stormwater drains. These weren't like huge extensive floods. And so we don't think that there was a lot of overland flushing that was occurring from these flood patches. Instead, we suspect that these high concentrations came from a source that was within the stormwater network. And to give you a sense of what I mean by these floods were very localized to the storm drain, this was the most extensive flood patch that we observed during this time period. So um, here you can see then there is some flooding that's occurring, but this almost looks like what you would see after a rain event or something, especially in Florida. Um, but this is occurring exclusively because of, I believe this one was exclusively because of a high tide event. There may have been a little bit of rain here as well. Um, but the concentrations, again, range from 40 to our maximum detection limit of almost 20, um, 24,196 in these floodwater patches. We also saw that when the floodwaters receded, that there were some locations. So in particular, there was one of the three locations we observed that would often have then elevated concentrations during that recession of the floodwaters.
So here you see the same plot I showed previously where you have rainfall, but now for three hours instead of 24 hours on the top panel. And on the bottom panel here, you're looking at just the uh, waterway sample data during the king tide period. So this is from the king tide in June, and this is from the king tide in July. And the type of point corresponds to whether or not the sample was collected at high, ebb, or low tide, and the colors correspond to our three different locations. But the main thing I want you to take away from this is anytime you see that a point is exceeding this EPA threshold, it was consistently occurring at ebb or low tide. So at high tide, we didn't see exceedances, but then as the water drains from the stormwater network, we would see some exceedances, but it was usually short-lived. So it would just be for that duration prior to the next high tide. Um, and this also didn't occur consistently across sites. So this also underscores the importance of accounting for site-to-site -site variation. We also went back this summer, this past summer in 2023, to collect additional data. And I just want to highlight here that we saw really similar trends. Um, so here, again, we're looking at the bacteria concentrations over, in this case, two different tidal cycles occurring during a king tide period. And here again, the colors correspond to different locations, but the main thing I want you to take away is that when we saw exceedances, they consistently occurred at low and ebb tide, so as the floodwaters were draining from the stormwater network. And so a question we've been asking then is, what's the source of this elevated bacteria? So if we don't have much overland flushing because these flood patches are quite small and local to the drains, what would be the source of the bacteria? And we know from some prior work um, done out of Rachel Noble's lab at UNC that we know in this particular system, so here in Beaufort, that there are sewage specific markers that are present throughout the stormwater network and also in Taylor's Creek at the, at the different outfall locations. And so we know that there's evidence of there being sewage exfiltration within the stormwater network. Um, but the samples that were collected for this study did occur, you know, they were collected a few years ago. And so we can't necessarily assume that the concentrations that we observed were necessarily coming from sewage, but we do think it's a possibility. So that's basically our main hypothesis for now, which is that the elevated concentrations are likely from exfiltrated sewage. And so from this study, what we learned is that floodwaters can impact the quality of receiving waterways, but rainfall has a greater impact. So our data really underscored that rainfall is a dominant driver of fecal contamination at the coast. But we did see that roadway floodwaters, while small, had high bacteria concentrations. And then when the floodwaters would recede back into the waterway, that they could cause short-term contamination. So short-term here being basically just on the falling tide. But there are some things that we don't know. So we don't know how concentrations in the stormwater network are relating to concentrations at the outfall. So this study was designed really just to focus on what was happening in Taylor's Creek, and we would collect the floodwater data as it was available, but we weren't really systematically trying to understand what was happening in the stormwater network as water came in and then receded. And so now with the data we have, we've started a new study and data was collected um, this past summer and fall to try and better understand the connections between the stormwater network and then the concentrations at the outfall. And we're again working with Adam Gold to include some process-based modeling of the movement of that floodwater as well. We also don't know the source of the bacteria when we sampled. So I mentioned this before, but I just want to emphasize it because that does remain a, a big question for us. And so there basically we I mentioned here then that we have exfiltrated sewage that we know from prior work could be within the stormwater network, but we've also been wondering if the stormwater pipe biofilms and the catch basin sediment could also be bacteria reservoirs. So we've seen what those catch basins look like. I had shown an image previously and I have some here on this slide. So we know that these stormwater systems can have quite a bit of muck in them and that that could be a reservoir for bacteria, but there's not really a strong basis in the literature to help us understand what those concentrations could be like. And so Julia Harrison, who I showed on this prior slide, as part of her um, PhD, she's working with Angela Harris uh, 
who's an assistant professor in civil engineering here to try and understand then what is the potential for these stormwater networks to be environmental reservoirs for fecal bacteria. And so I'm just going to quickly spotlight some of the work she's been doing. Um, so in Beaufort, we had a coordinated field campaign where while Megan was collecting data from Taylor's Creek and then also in the stormwater network and in roadway floodwaters, Julia was then also collecting sediment samples. That's what you see here from the bottom of the stormwater catch basin. And she was also scraping the biofilms in these stormwater pipes and then measuring enterococcus as well as E. coli bacteria from those samples. And so she was collecting samples specifically from these two different separate stormwater networks within Beaufort. And so here I'll briefly highlight what she found. So we have the concentration shown on an aerial basis. So you can't do a direct one-to-one -one comparison with what we had with the water samples because that was done by volume. Um, but here, in this case, we're looking at the biofilm data. So this is telling you the amount of biofilm per, or the amount of bacteria per square foot of biofilm. Um, and we have then four different sampling times corresponding to two different king tide events. And so the, the green bars are showing you the concentrations from the one stormwater network and the purple is showing you the concentrations from a separate stormwater network. And so what we see here is that while we had some instances where E. coli, for example, was low, the enterococcus was consistently pretty elevated across the two different networks. We also saw in terms of the sediment, um, so that would be basically the muck that's collecting at the bottom of that catch basin, that the catch basin sediment also had pretty high concentrations in some cases, particularly of enterococcus. So here now, this is shown as yet another unit. So this is the amount of bacteria per dry gram of biofilm because we don't have a continuous estimate of how much biofilm was in the pipe. Um, so these are preliminary data, but what we can gather though from these concentrations that we're seeing is that there is a possibility that these, the sediment in the biofilm could be acting as an environmental reservoir. So this is still very preliminary, but what we found is that the E. coli and enterococci were found in both the biofilms and the sediment. Um, so this is also important to emphasize because it's, it's indicating then that these bacteria, they're not just in fecal matter, but they can also be found in the environment um, with enterococci being in greater abundance than E. coli. The bacteria levels were relatively high, which indicates that the stormwater network itself could be a bacteria reservoir, but this data is very preliminary. So this is exploratory work that's ongoing. All right, so we've done quite a bit of work now in Beaufort. We're really intrigued by the results we have there, but we also want to understand to what extent are other communities potentially experiencing the same type of fecal contamination, in particular in the floodwaters. So the results we saw from Beaufort, what we thought was potentially concerning is that pedestrians make contact with the floodwaters. Uh, I've seen kids playing in the floodwaters as though they're kind of like rain puddles, and we now know that that's, they're not rain puddles, and that they shouldn't be treated as such. Um, but we wanted to understand to what extent is this potentially a problem unique to one community, or can we find the same type of problem elsewhere? And so this um, question is motivating a different chapter of Megan's research. And so to answer this question, we wanted to go to a community that was experiencing more extensive tidal floods than what we observed in Beaufort. And so we went to Carolina Beach, which is located in the southern part of the North Carolina coast. Um, and this is an image from the first time we went out to collect samples there uh, last August. And so I'm standing here on the left and one of my undergrad research assistants, Caroline Woods, is on the right. And what you can see here is we're about knee deep in water. So it was about one and a half feet of water. Uh, and there's really extensive flooding that occurs in Carolina Beach. So work from my colleague, Catherine Anardi, who I think gave a seminar to this group last semester, has shown that in Carolina Beach, they've had floods, I believe last year it was about 90 times where there was at least standing water on the road. So not necessarily, well, definitely not to this extent that you're seeing this image. This didn't happen 90 times, but this happens several times throughout the span of the year. And so we've gone to Carolina Beach on four different occasions to capture four different flood events. And this was one of the floods we sampled in early October. And so you can see here, again, really extensive flooding continuously spanning several blocks. 
And so in Carolina Beach, uh, Carolina Beach spans a barrier island and the mainland. And there's a bay here that's referred to as the Yacht Basin. And then up further north, you have an inlet that goes um, out to the Atlantic Ocean, and it also connects with the intercoastal. And so what we've focused on then is this part of Carolina Beach, which is where the most extensive flooding occurs. So this tidal flooding is often going to be hyper local. And there's a road here called Canal Drive that experiences the most severe flooding. So on Canal Drive, the road elevation is quite low. And because of that, then water from the yacht basin during high tides or higher water level events will then come up through both the stormwater system, but also lo low shorelines. Um, such as shorelines that basically haven't been hardened, so are just kind of continuous marsh. Um, and so across this stretch of Canal Drive, we collected samples at seven intersections shown here with these red dots. And then there were three different locations where we could also collect samples from the yacht basin through access to public docks. So ideally, we'd be able to pair every single intersection site with a waterway site, but that would require access to private property. So we're collecting samples at intersections because that's where the stormwater infrastructure is concentrated, where you have then multiple drains where the water could come up when the flooding occurs. All right, so we've been out there four different times. And again, there are seven intersections. And so I'm showing here the results from these four different field campaigns. So on the y-axis, you have intersections. So this is showing you south to north as we go along Canal Drive and collect samples from the different intersections. So here's Sandpiper Lane up through Periwinkle Lane. And the gray bar is showing you the concentration of Enterococcus. And for those three sites where we could also collect a waterway sample for comparison, those data are shown as blue bars. The red line here once again corresponds to that EPA threshold for safe public use of recreational waters. And so across these different floods, these two were very extensive and continuous across several blocks, whereas the floods we observed on August 29th and October 30th were still quite extensive, but they weren't completely continuous across uh, all of those seven blocks. So instead, you'd have some patches here and there, but still some substantial flooding. And what we saw, as what we saw in Beaufort, was that the concentrations across several of the intersections were exceeding that EPA threshold for safe public use, um, and often by one to two orders of magnitude. So again, this scale is shown on a log scale. And so what we learned from this community is that even though there's much greater flood extent, which I thought could also mean that there would be greater dilution potential, we saw that the floodwater fecal bacteria concentrations were high. So again, often exceeding this EPA um, safe public use threshold. And if we do a back of the envelope estimate, so this is a very crude estimate, but if we if we look to the literature to see what the concentrations of Enterococcus are in raw sewage and compare that then to what we saw within our floodwaters, we could estimate that sewage could conceivably be about 1 to 10 percent of the floodwater volume. Um, but we don't know the source of the bacteria. So here I'm making an assumption about sewage when I do this back of the envelope estimate, um, but it's possible then that sewage is not the primary source. And so what we don't know, again, for this site is the source of the bacteria, but in this case, we were more prepared to answer this question. So we've also been working again with my colleague Angela to collect samples so that we can start to measure pathogens, but also measure different sewage specific indicators, as well as microbial source tracking targets that could tell us about other potential sources. We also don't know the extent of the problem, and this is speaking beyond Carolina Beach. So in this case now we've documented fecal contamination and floodwaters in two communities, but we don't know if this is a pervasive issue because that will require data from many, many communities. Um, so in particular, I know there's a lot of tidal flooding that happens in Florida. Actually, the motivation for the initial study, which was funded through the National Science Foundation, came from an experience I had when I was visiting family in St. Petersburg and we got trapped during one of these tidal floods uh, and I started wondering about the impacts on water quality. And so I think there are a lot of places in Florida where these same types of questions we'd be, we've been asking would be really interesting places to study and try and address these questions further. Um, and so if you're interested in working with me on that, I would love to expand.
We also don't know if there are health risks to pedestrians. So here I've mentioned that the concentrations were pretty consistently, although not, I shouldn't say consistently, there were several cases where the concentrations were exceeding that EPA threshold for safe public use, but that threshold has been developed for recreational waters like beaches and open estuary and waters. And people interact with those waters in a much different way than they do with floodwaters. So uh, people aren't diving into floodwaters and going head first and um, potentially ingesting the water directly. So it would be more so a concern for kids who might be playing in the water and ingesting it. Um, but the, the health risks we would expect to be quite different. And we might expect then for there to be a different concentration threshold associated with legitimate health risks. Um, that would be more specific to floodwaters. So additional research is needed to really understand not just what the concentrations are, but also what is the associated health risk due to differences in exposure. Um, but based on what we saw, we, we concluded from our work, but also work out of Norfolk, which was showing similar trends in terms of elevated fecal bacteria concentrations in floodwaters that it was worthwhile to create an outreach document um, that would alert the public that there are potentially concerns with the water quality of floodwaters. And so we published a bulletin through North Carolina Sea Grant that you can access through this link, go.ncsu.edu slash tidal floods, in which we outline what we know and what we don't know, but also what are different mitigation measures that people can take to protect themselves. And we point to specific EPA and CDC guidance. And so to conclude then, I'm going back to this title then of Come Hell or High Water. And so this is alluding to the fact that there's a certain amount of inevitability when it comes to fecal contamination in human dominated landscapes, but particularly in the context of climate change. Um, and so to summarize some big takeaways from the studies that we've been conducting, while this work is still preliminary, I think there are some high level takeaways. Uh, so coastal fecal contamination is occurring through many different mechanisms, whether it's through rain and runoff, but also we're seeing that tidal floods, while of lesser importance in the study systems we had um, to rain, is still showing that it can create opportunities for exposure to fecal contamination. The source and extent of fecal contamination problems from tidal flooding are unknown, uh, but the infrastructure problems that we observed, we don't think are unique necessarily to these two uh, communities that we've studied. So infrastructure was not designed for sea level rise or changing rainfall patterns, and we have reason to expect that infrastructure failures across coastal communities will occur under climate change, which could lead to then these more chronic instances of fecal contamination. But we need more studies across more sites to really have a sense for the extent to which these infrastructure failures are occurring. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Natalie. I'll uh, yeah, put you up big on the screen, but if you want to share slides again, that's fine as well. So questions for Natalie from the room. Give them like the 30 second uncomfortable pause, OK, Natalie? <laughs> sure. All I can say is last semester's seminar <laughs> Had tons and tons of questions. So I know you guys can have as many as they did, at least. I got one. You got, well, I know you have it. <laughs> and I know Mark Brown has one and all the rest, but. <laughs> any questions about how the research was done or what's the importance of the findings? Hi, I have a question. Great, go ahead. <clears throat> so I'm interested in, do you plan to give somehow inspire uh, motivation to resolve the stormwater infrastructure? And how would you go about that? How would you get the research into the right hands? Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Well, you know, we've been communicating with different decision makers in these two communities. So we've been working with people across both the local municipal government level all the way up through state level to share our findings. I think one thing right now that's challenging in terms of um, getting to solution development, the reason why I kept emphasizing in my talk that we don't know the source is because knowing the source is critical to understanding how to resolve the problem. And so what we're doing now is basically initially problem characterization. 
And now we're moving more towards collecting more data to get at sources, to get at pathogens, which can also, as far as I understand, give us an indication about source. Um, so we're trying to really get a good grip on what we think the source is, such that we can then start to make more actionable solutions towards addressing the problem. Great, Thank you. Yeah. So do you think there might be a seasonality to some of the concentrations that you find? Like, uh, I, my wonky understanding of microbes is generally, but they do better in warm temperatures and worse in cold. Um, and it seemed like most of the dates you did were sort of like late fall and summer, where it's still warm-ish in North Carolina, from my understanding. Um, so just if you had thought about looking into that at all, too, to see maybe that might, have, might skew data or could also change like going up and down the coast. So if you're looking at Florida, it might be worse or whatever. Just thoughts on that. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. No, it's a great question. So definitely, I, I mean, we know that seasonality plays an important role in bacteria concentrations across an annual scale. We also know, well, we suspect in these communities that seasonality is also important to think about in terms of the amount of people who are there. So for example, when we were there in August, tons of tourists, um, a lot of the houses there are also seasonally occupied. And so we also think that if there were to be wastewater treatment system failures, or maybe not even treatment system, but the transport system failures, that the system would be more loaded in the time of year when it's more populated. So I, I think your question was primarily around temperature, but we think there is also seasonality to account for in terms of the population dynamics. But one thing that is important to account for with tidal flooding is in this part of the country, it's primarily occurring late summer through basically around like November. So there's also a strong seasonality to when tidal flooding occurs. Um, I mean, we have floods in other times of year, but I think our data is capturing the time period when you would expect like the most extensive flooding, but it's a great question and we would need to have more data to really get at the seasonality part of this as a function of temperature. Yeah. Another question in the back. Um, I was wondering if you knew of any, like, you considered socioeconomic um, factors in this and, like, if the area was less, um, like, economically advanced and there was less infrastructure, like, if it's more dilapidated, if that can play into it and if, like, some poor areas will be more affected by this and it's more dangerous in areas where the infrastructure is more dilapidated than in wealthier areas? Yeah, another great question. So we've been considering the age of the system. So for example, Beaufort is a really old town, although they've made quite a few upgrades to their um, sanitary sewer system and stormwater system in recent years. And from what I've seen in most communities, you have a mix of old and new pipes because they're constantly replacing pipes as there are issues and as they can get grant money. Um, so. We are thinking about it. In these two communities, we haven't really done a deep dive on that, but we do have funding to start collecting samples in a rural area um, that is, it doesn't have as much social status, so there's less political representation, lower income, um, and we'll be collecting data there of, of the floodwaters. And there we're also trying to understand what do rural communities that aren't connected to centralized stormwater and wastewater systems have in their floodwaters. Like, Maybe the flood water has better water quality because the water is not coming up through a centralized sewer system, but maybe the water quality is worse because there's a lot of on-site sewage treatment, uh, which could lead to higher potential concentrations during flood conditions. So there are a lot of questions to ask related to a community's infrastructure that we're still parsing through. Sorry, Mark, we'll let you have yours there. Right. Hey, Natalie, thanks for your talk. It was great. Um, so a uh, quick question, although the, the thresholds for human contact are concentration based, I'm curious, are you looking at loads at all um, and seeing how that, I would assume those would increase over time as the frequency and the volume of, you know, um, storm surge or even high water flooding events starts to increase relative to presumably maybe the static rainfall. But I'm just curious about loads. And I also have a, another question, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Great. So loads. We have, so in Carolina Beach, um, as part of Megan's analysis, she is going to be looking at loads. There we're trying to do a kind of mass balance where we would have assumed concentrations of different sources like sewage. 
And we have um, colleagues, so basically out of Catherine and Artie's group, one of her students, Thomas Tellen, has a mechanistic model that can estimate the flood water volume. And so we're going to use those flood water volume estimates with our concentrations to start looking at load change. Um, I think it's harder in some of the other systems because they're not closed. Like, I don't know how we would be able to get good volume estimates without a model. And so in Carolina Beach, we have the model which can help us get to volume, but otherwise, at least in Beaufort, I, I'm sure it's possible, but for right now, we don't have the information needed to, to have a good volume estimate. And then the real quick follow-up question, are you all looking at inline check valves or anything to actually prevent the backflow process? Yeah, in Carolina Beach, they actually have, um, they have check valves and duck bills installed, I think, I want to say across all of the intersections. I could be wrong. I know that they definitely have several and they're independent stormwater lines in Carolina Beach across the intersections, but I believe that they have backflow devices installed on most. And in Beaufort, they definitely have installed some backflow devices, but there they're quite effective. Um, so they're actually, we were expecting to see more flooding this past summer than we did. And we think that we didn't see much because they've installed um, the backflow devices. Yeah, they're installing those in Cedar Key and they're quite effective. Yeah. Ah, nice. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, I think also based on connections with groundwater and the elevation of the road, I mean, there are a lot of factors that influence the performance of those. As far as I understand, I'm no expert in backflow device design. So I'll give you one last. So as you're um, looking to do new work, are you moving beyond pathogens? What's the next sort of contentment that you're maybe a uh, student might be interested in looking at that is of public health or environmental consequence that follow the same type of a uh, scientific approach, but looking at something else, what's next on the list? It's a great question. I don't think I'm well equipped to answer the question. I'll, I'll tell you the reason why we've been focusing on fecal indicator bacteria is because that is what the existing regulations are anchored in. And so to make sure that our research is as relevant as possible to policy making. We want to ensure that we're using the same criterion pollutants. But I also know, so in Norfolk, they've looked at nutrient concentrations and they found some really interesting repercussions of tidal floods on nitrogen loading. And my colleague, Angela Harris, is always interested in the antimicrobial resistant bacteria um, and investigating those avenues. But I don't think I know enough about <laughs> different emerging contaminants to be able to provide a good answer. All right, well, let's give another round of applause, Dr. Nelson. Next week, uh, we have Dr. Suman Jumani coming from the Nature Conservancy to talk about unlocking rivers, a toolbox for strategic dam removal planning. So, totally different. Um, and so, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. All right, thanks so much, Mark. Thank you, Natalie. Yeah, you. thanks so much. Bye, everyone.